Good day. This is uh, Charles Denham uh, of uh, Texas Medical Institute of Technology, and we want to welcome you to our High Performer Webinar Series at Safety Leaders. Uh, we're delighted to have a great uh, session today, and uh, we'd like to just uh, have uh, just make uh, uh, a couple of statements regarding some housekeeping details. I'm on slide three, and if you want to look down at your lower left-hand corner of your screen, if you're not getting good audio, uh, you can click on that uh, icon that has a telephone, and we can help you get uh, a separate uh, uh, line uh, to improve your audio. But make sure that you have your speaker volume uh, all the way up to the max. Uh, I'm on slide four. For those of you that have not downloaded the slides, if you go to www.safetyleaders.org, on the landing page, you will see uh, a What's New column up in the upper right-hand corner. And if you click on the Chief Quality Safety Officer in the New World and Dream Teams, uh, it will take you to uh, the page that, for those of you that are watching, uh, I have up now. It has Dr. Mike Henderson and Dr. Uh, uh, Toph Peabody, uh, their pictures on the screen. and. This is the place on the web where you can go back and listen to the webinar and also download resources that we may add to it. On slide six, um, you could follow us on Twitter and Facebook, and we just have uh, those icons uh, and hashtags uh, on that screen. On slide seven, uh, our calling is to accelerate performance solutions that save lives, save money, and create value in the communities we serve and ventures we undertake. Our purpose statement, which we don't have up, is we'll measure our success by how we protect and enrich the lives of families. And in light of this recent Ebola uh, issue and some of the topics that we'll add into our discussion today, it's a fitting purpose. Our disclosure statement, which I won't read for you, is on slide eight. And uh, uh, it, you may read each one of the disclosures of our speakers. And there are no funder or educational grantor has had any influence or direct contact uh, with researchers, analysts, or hospital leaders uh, that we're working with. So I'm now on slide 10. And we have Dr. Mike Henderson, who will uh, be our first speaker, uh, addressing this new role and the role of quality uh, chief quality officers. Uh, Dr. Chris Peabody, who uh, will talk to us about the concept of dream teams, how, really how to prevent burnout and light up dream teams that can help keep our dreams alive. Uh, Sharon Rossmark, who is a trustee and a longstanding wonderful contributor uh, to the work that we do together for you uh, from the area of the, the trustees and governance, uh, and has been a non-clinical um, leader, quality leader, at uh, one of our uh, hospitals, lar one of our large hospitals. Uh, Jennifer Dingman, a longstanding contributor, uh, patient safety advocate, co-author of a number of uh, works that are in the peer review literature and also the NQF safe practices. And so what we'd like to do is have Jenny again uh, uh, focus us on uh, our priorities today. And we'll ask her to open with a 30 to 45 second statement that can help us just get grounded in what we're to do today. Jenny, would you take it away? Thank you, Dr. Denham. I am delighted to be here today and so grateful to each and every one of you to, for being here today to learn more about how to keep your patients safe and healthy, particularly in the wake of our new issue of this Ebola problem. Um, please keep all of the clinicians taking care of these sick patients in your thoughts and prayers because our frontline providers are the very most important people out there to keep people healthy and safe. Um, I'm excited about the content of today's webinar, and um, thank you again for being here. It means the world to myself and many of my colleagues. Dr. Denham, I'll hand it back to you. Thanks, Jenny. And Jenny has been uh, part of a, a team that have been working together for some time. Uh, who worked on the HACS, the Hospital Acquired Conditions work, NQF Safe Practices, HRSA teams, and a number of others. Uh, I'm going to set the context of this new world for quality leaders by addressing a concept that we learned, and I'm on slide 13, from a fellow by the name of Doug Krug, and I've put uh, uh, a copy, uh, uh, a, a screen capture of his book up on our slide, and also took just a very, uh, very uh, uh, quick scan of a concept that you will find in his book uh, that he co-wrote with uh, Ed Oakley, and it's called Net Forward Energy. Those of you that worked on the teams for the Partnership for Patients that were led by, I think, one of the greatest social entrepreneurs we've ever had, uh, 
uh, with, uh, uh, and we find them in CMS, Dennis Wagner and Paul McGann and others, uh, have brought Doug in to help people focus on social entrepreneurship. And I think in this time of this crisis of Ebola and you know the, just the frenetic nature of what's gone on now that we have the internet and bloggers and uh, people laying blame and, and, and a lot of what we see uh, going on, which I, I've even experienced in the last year, it's really important to focus on uh, the forward issues and positive energy because in healthcare we tend to pride ourselves in critical thinking and spend a lot of time on the negative. And what Doug has helped us understand is, is that it, it's important to, as, for leaders to prioritize positive energy towards solutions to meet objectives. And although we can learn from what went wrong and uh, we tend to blame people and, and we tend to preoccupy ourselves, and especially the media does. And I'm watching uh, the, the, uh, on CNN to, right now that the congressional testimonies are always focused on the negative. It's really important at a time of crisis to focus on the solutions needed and the reasons why things uh, haven't worked to discipline ourselves to really focus on what Mike Henderson will share with you, the basics, and really bring to the party the positive energy. And I think those, the, many of you are real leaders at great organizations. It's important, and I would recommend the Enlightened Leadership book. We use it for a lot of uh, mentoring of leaders. Uh, really great principle. In our last webinars, we talked about crisis. Uh, and, and any crisis is personal, and I know that the caregivers across the country now scrambling with the Ebola crisis and those that uh, are dear friends at uh, Texas Health Resources who have really been the focus of the spotlight, um, that, that leading through crisis is, is something that we really have to take a breath and say, wait a minute, there's extremely high risk around that time period, but there's also a great opportunity for healing, for learning, and for growth. And all of us are faced with a number of crises, and I just have consolidated the slides from the last uh, session that we had, because we'll be going forward and, and focusing on some CME, CEU, and continuing education training on leading through crisis, and uh, this issue is that uh, issue. I know, boringly, I bring up this slide over and over again. It's the ARC study of 600,000 staffers, and I think as we see with the unfolding crisis of Ebola, we're seeing Trust is a major issue. Leaders have to focus on winning the trust of the caregivers, and it's absolutely critical that we do so, and I think it's a really important indicator. Uh, as you look at CNN and you look at what, uh, what we're describing didn't happen, and we're, we, we look at what uh, has happened in the news just today, these are screen captures from today, uh, a Dallas nurse speaks out on what didn't work and what didn't happen. Uh, this is an expression of I think all of our nursing staff uh, across the country, and uh, it's very important that leaders focus with net forward energy on building trust, protecting them, and, and really celebrating the great work they do, but really focusing on where the vision and mission of the organization has to be translated through mid-level managers. And those of you that are quality and safety leaders like Mike Henderson and work with people like Mike really need to recognize how important that is and why it's so critically important that these crises are very personal and, we, and the energy heats up and the fog of war sets in. And it's, I think, critical that we keep our positive energy focused on what Mike will share with you, the basics. As we look at the shift from, and as Mike and I talked about his presentation and some of the work that he'll be doing, and I think we'll see some great articles from Mike in the future regarding this enormous shift we have in our marketplace from volume focus to value focus, that there's a zone of chaos right now uh, where we're all scrambling to deal with this. And this is the longer term kind of crisis that we're dealing with. And then there's an enormous opportunity to do good and actually uh, use this zone of chaos as an innovation zone and try new things. So as I introduce Mike, I just want to again conclude by putting this back up and say, you know, I know we're in a crisis on Ebola. We're in a crisis in patient safety and quality. Uh, try out the concept of net forward energy, of limiting the amount of negative focus on what's going wrong and maximize the focus on the solutions that we need. And as I introduce Mike, I, I think one of the exciting things about, uh, about him 
is, is that he was a very highly respected surgeon. He has uh, received his medical training at St. Andrews University uh, in Scotland, completed uh, surgical training in Edinburgh, came to the U.S. in 1978. He was a leader at Emory University in Atlanta and moved to the Cleveland Clinic in 1992 as chairman of general surgery and the direct, uh, director of the transplant center. Main interest had been portal hypertension, hepatobiliary, uh, and pancreatic surgery. And I think he's been able, as a leader, to really command the respect of the other surgeons and the leaders of the most complex areas of medicine and taking the helm of patient safety and quality brought the credibility to that, and he's going to describe for us uh, uh, the journey uh, that he has undertaken at the uh, Cleveland Clinic and how they've taken, they treat some of the sickest patients in the world and have been able to build, uh, I think, a, a, an excellent model that all of us can, uh, can learn from. Uh, and so uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Henderson is currently the chief quality officer at the Cleveland Clinic and has established the institute the Quality and Patient Safety Institute for the Cleveland Clinic Health System, and I think in a very novel way has leveraged the talent of uh, uh, the rising stars of multiple uh, uh, er areas of the clinic to uh, make quality and safety a high priority and not just an afterthought, but a, a core priority of each of their other institutes across uh, the Cleveland Clinic. And so, Mike, uh, with that introduction, could you take us away? Uh, thanks, Chuck. I uh, appreciate the introduction, and I am pleased to be back on one of your webinars to talk about some of the work that I do have a passion for. So I will, in the next uh, 20 minutes or so, outline the journey I've been on over these last eight years and think about where this is really going as we move forward in the current healthcare era. So what I'll try and cover is the role of the Chief Quality Officer and really how that fits in at these various levels with leadership, having some infrastructure, the people you need, the functions that have to be done, and then the work that really needs to get covered in, this, in the scope of this role. Uh, leadership is important. You keep hearing about it, and it's real. And I think getting leadership involved is one of the Chief Quality Officer's main role. If you start at the bottom of those ones, it's really the clinical side of it, because that's where it all happens, at the clinical front line. So having clinical leaders involved is critical. But then the executive leadership in hospitals and health systems and the talk about engaging the board, again, a critical step. Uh, and that's a combination of education uh, uh, as well as putting them in a position to be able to make appropriate uh, decisions to support the safety and quality activities. The chief quality officer also is important member of the strategic planning team. I've got a lot more into that space over the last two or three years of the clinic. But what happens in the safety and quality arena has to fit into that bigger picture. And uh, again, it's uh, getting us uh, on track and uh, based in the realities of what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis as the pressures rise as we move from the volume to value seen. Uh, it's difficult for healthcare. It's difficult for frontline providers. So the chief quality officer has got to help keep everyone on track. In creating the system, there's not one size fits all. And I often get asked, what do I really need to do to put something together? And the answer is, it depends. It depends where your health system is, uh, what are the priorities, where are the gaps, exactly what are you responsible for as the chief quality officer. There is not a single job description for this. So it's understanding what the priorities are within your health system and supporting those priorities. I think these bits at the bottom here of what are the essential components to an infrastructure and model, I would submit are having clinical leadership. And that's why I took this role on. As Chuck said, I, I'm a surgeon. I continue to practice over this last eight years I've been doing this chief quality officer role. So understanding what's happening at the clinical front line and being able to talk to clinical leaders and engaging respected clinicians as part of your infrastructure is important. What I've learned is that the content expert keep me straight. I can't be a content expert in all the territory you need to cover uh, in this role, and I will talk a bit more about that. But then ultimately it is at the front line. 
is that local ownership and implementation is where the work gets done. How do you engage that, that group uh, in your health system to make it really work? So these are the bits I will cover. So the people really that uh, I felt that I've had to work with are here. It's the physicians, nursing, and depending on your system, you may identify other important clinical leaders for your quality and safety program. The content experts that uh, I turn to are those in patient safety and quality. That's a very broad term. Oh, we can define that a little more later. Uh, Clinical risk falls under my purview, but that's about understanding when things go wrong, why they've gone wrong. It's that group that will do those investigations and prevent the next one. Infection prevention, performance improvement, other key areas of content expertise that are part of the team uh, in my experience. Uh, the frontline teams, and the way we have been approaching this is to have clinical leads depending on the project, some content expertise in that area, and then using a lot of project management for performance improvement. Uh, again, a theme I'll return to a little later. But get all the right stakeholders. Who are the important frontline caregivers? And I really got these people engaged in the work that needs to get done. So here are the functions that really felt kind of have fallen under my purview. Uh, we love that top word, regulatory, but it's a fact of life. There is increased oversight and regulation in healthcare, accreditation, uh, and appropriately holding us to standards, conditions of participation uh, for safety and for outcomes. Uh, the healthcare inspections stand, extend a whole lot beyond just standard accreditation surveys. You've got radiation safety, biosafety, hazardous materials, there are other things sitting in there that uh, I think one needs to have a system within your health, uh, hospital or health system to make sure those are well managed. Well managed. Safety, safety is about patients and caregivers. Uh, we tend to ignore some of the safety issues with caregivers, but I think that's important to have on your radar screen. The quality bit is really about where are the gaps and what are specific goals with targets. I'll, I'll return a little to that later. Clinical risk, that's the adverse event management. Do you have a good event reporting system? Who looks at that? How do you manage that? How do you look at the serious events and take appropriate action plans to follow through? And then really make sure the, the loop get clo gets closed at the end of that. And in my book, the hottest topic at the moment really are the hospital acquired infections. And guess what? Ebola has really put that on our radar screen. If something good that can really come out of this, in my opinion, is going to make us all be a whole lot better at preventing hospital-acquired infections over the next uh, uh, months as we work our way through the Ebola crisis. The work that needs to get done, this is how I look at it, is uh, shown here. It's about uh, for your health system, defining where there are gaps, having some clear, focused priorities. If you have too many, you don't fix them. So it's top, choosing that top half dozen priorities and having clear plans of how they're going to be addressed. It's engaging the front line. This is where the best ideas come from. This is where you want ownership. Those are easy things to say, harder to do. And it's developing and implementing appropriate plans. Now, I, in my academic career, it was hypothesis testing. This is just a further extension of that approach, really thinking about what are the specific goals, what are the aims here, what are the timelines, and having a firm plan for implementation. People work hard at this, and recognizing that, uh, uh, recognizing success, and following the metrics with scorecard is clearly part of the repertoire. And one of the hardest things, again, in healthcare, we're bad to do the quick fixes and find that six months or a year later, we're back where we started. So how do you put systems in place to sustain those gains? And that's about the ownership. Who really has this once the project is completing? And who is uh, going to hold people accountable to longer-term outcomes? Again, these are the focuses. So 
two basic principles that I have found useful in doing this work are here. The first is the high reliability organization concept. And if you work this pyramid from the bottom up, it's about setting goals, having accountability to performance with very specific targets and scorecards to help you move along that way. I can't overemphasize the leadership commitment. If your leadership's not on board, it's very hard to make progress and move. Culture we hear a lot about. Uh, I've kind of banned my people talking too much about a culture of safety, because it's culture overall. It's about employee engagement. It's about the whole patient experience. It's about the culture in the broader sense, rather than just being about a classic culture of safety, although that is an important component of the overall culture. Uh, the role of performance improvement and some of the robust methods that have come from industry uh, I, I play an important role. It's about standardizing approaches, so you end up standardizing practices that are measurable and can really drive improvement. Again, some of the work I've been privileged to do with the Joint Commission in the Center for Transforming Healthcare really focuses on robust performance improvement. This is the future. This is where we make the progress. And that's what leads to high reliability and safe care. The other important concept that I find valuable is the whole serving leader concept. My component of that is what I'm showing on this slide, which is about the engagement of the front line. Those closest to the work know best how to fix it. But if you don't engage them right at the front end and have them develop the ideas, they never own it. So it's how you get that combination. And sometimes you've got to let things that you know probably won't work. You've got to let them work their way through. Uh, if they don't get the space to try it and find out why it doesn't work, and if you force something on them right at the beginning, you're not going to win. So engagement is important. Good steering there also helps. And the leadership role is to set the priorities, as we talked about, uh, to support the overall project and to resource them and then responsible for overall engagement and the accountability components at the end of the day. So I will quickly run through how we've approached this at the Cleveland Clinic. This is uh, my overall org chart for quality and safety. And here in the middle line here are what I call my content experts, who oversees our regulatory activities, accreditation, environmental health, safety. Infection prevention, expertise, critically important these days, clinical risk management, safety, both patient safety, employee and environmental safety. And then the overall quality bit that in my repertoire really includes all the required reporting we have to do and the activities in those spaces. So these content experts report up to our safety quality leadership here. We are large, main campus 1,200 beds eight regional hospitals in town. So I have people who oversee main campus in our regional hospitals reporting out to leadership and the board. But then this other concept at the bottom of the slide where these content experts are supporting the local implementation ownership. And this is our clinical arena. This is in our clinical institutes, disease-based institutes, cardiovascular, digestive disease, or our smaller regional hospitals where a team with quality director, physician lead, a nursing lead, some administrative support are critically important in translating much of the content expertise to the clinical front line and helping steer the projects being developed at the local level. And I view it also in this context. The chief quality officer has to conduct this orchestra. And it's about what really needs to happen with the leaders. It's clearly an educational component. You rapidly become a, a content expert in much of this space yourself, but translating from the real content experts what has to be done to leadership is important. Uh, and one has to say it many times. But using leadership to approve and help set the priorities and the goals, to provide the resources, and to review the overall scorecards and accountability is the role of leadership in our environment. The content experts help really identify the gaps. What are the expectations? What do we need to do and achieve? 
And then these are the teams I talked about at the local level of making sure you've got the right stakeholders. Those people at the front lines, the best ideas, are also the people who are going to do the work. But you've got to give them ownership. You've got to let them have some headroom to help drive that change. This one summarizes some of how I view our system culture. One of the best things Toby Cosgrove, our CEO, did a uh, half dozen years ago was really build the mantra around patient first. And truly, that is a culture I think we have got to, but there's this culture of we are all caregivers. And this is really about the employee engagement. This is about everyone realizing no matter what your role in, in our hospital, be it cleaning the floors, delivering the food, operating in the operating rooms, we're all caregivers. You know, our medical staff pushed back on this a little initially, but everyone buys into this now. It is truly part of our culture. The patient-centered bit around patient experience, again, a huge focus. It is about the patients. That's why we come to work every day. And then the safety culture component of safety service and a just culture, all of these build together as a single culture uh, in, that, uh, in that whole program. On the accreditation, that overall regulatory front, again, I view that in these buckets. When I first took on this role, we talked a lot about continual readiness. I guess I just didn't know what that meant at that stage. Nowadays, you need to know that. Surveys are very different. CMS is much more active in the picture across the country, complaint surveys and the like. So everyone needs to understand that this is good for patients. It's about standardizing practices. It's about everyone understanding what we as caregivers need to do. And a huge emphasis of readiness is around patient safety. As I said, complaint surveys have really increased. There's increased scrutiny, and all of these create that risk of full hospital surveys to all the conditions of participation. There's going to be more of this. There is no question that this is part of the patient-centered culture of American healthcare at the moment where complaints are encouraged that lead to uh, the regulatory authorities looking at hospitals and seeing what we're up to. It's right. It's making things better for patients. And then really the work for continual readiness is the work of our accreditation teams doing traces of patients through our system and readiness runs for the environment and practices as we uh, are in a state of continual readiness for survey. Quality data, this just emphasizes that there's so much out there, it's hard to know what to pay attention to. I would submit that if you pay attention to the material that's in hospital compare, again, what's important in your environment. Many of these others are pulling material from hospital compare over the next four or five years, physician compare and physician-specific data is going to become much more important. The Joint Commission standards are there, but I'm not sure that's as critical and a source for how we need to work. All these others have their roles. We all have our favorites. Every hospital scores well somewhere. But I think paying attention to these is less important than paying attention to the data that really matters because this is where much of the pay for performance as we move from value, volume to value is coming from. This is where the data is coming from. So this is measuring this. And, and, and don't forget, the commercial payers are also measuring this independently, usually from their own populations and their own data. And we're being measured really to help uh, drive us into that pay for performance era. So I view data in two sets. There's the external data, that stuff I just showed you, which is largely about reputation, but increasingly about payment, uh, which is a mixture of process, outcomes measures, but also patient experience and some of the efficiency and money metrics are getting in there. The problem here, of course, is the data out there publicly is one to three years old. You can't really drive performance improvement of that data. Hence, the second type of quality and safety data, your internal data, and that's the data used for performance improvement. This is where your internal scorecards are. It doesn't exactly match the external data, but you've got to figure out what of your internal data is going to drive your improvement on your external data. This is what you use for your accountability. 
And this is relevant for caregivers. This is what we try to change from. But you have to engage them and have everyone understand why you're using the data you use. And the goal is to have data that's within that month. Some of it may take you up to three months to really get that good internal data that you use for internal use and to drive improvement. I think all of us across the country are basically working towards the same thing. Here's where we are, and I would lay odds that almost all of you on the line today are in very similar places. Zero preventable harm is the mantra. It should be. This is about preventing serious harm in our hospitals, hospital infections, patient safety indicators. Tough goal, but it has to be the goal. Uh, and then the public metrics. Everyone's striving for improvement. And it is impressive how much improvement does be made across the country. And one of the things I like about partnership for patients, it's a way of documenting some of that progress. When you see ICU and collapse infections reduced to about 50 percent over the last five years, that's impressive for the country. So that's that mixture of the process measures, mortality. Let's stop talking about readmissions. Let's talk about care coordination. Uh, this is the metric, the readmissions that we're uh, locked into at the moment. But we're only making that better as so we really get a whole lot better at care coordination. And then there are specialty metrics that may also be important. A couple of examples of some of the stuff from the Cleveland Clinic here. You know, patient safety indicators have been one of our main metrics. You probably all know what they are, but we took that uh, composite measure and really looking at our total numbers across our health system. When we started to get to that top decile, we reckon we need to get down to about 75 per month. Uh, will get us down to that top decile across the country. That's a lot of work, a lot of credence, credibility to the front line. Much of this was really about understanding the metrics. Some of it was about documentation. Once you cleaned that up, it then became important around the real work around VTE prevention or pneumothorax uh, and having some standardized approaches to how we did these things. So again, you're all going to have different reasons for doing it. Again, hospital-acquired infections, uh, those of you on the call, I'm sure know these are the ones that are publicly out there into or coming into the payment programs. What was important for us in making transition here was to stop talking about hospital infection rates and moving to absolute counts. My front line always had trouble in understanding what 1.25 collapses per thousand lying days really meant. Once we started talking about patients, they said, I get it. And we can focus. And you know, last year across our health system, we were running about uh, 34 of these per month. A lot of focus came in. And this year, it's undoubtedly coming down. But the goal here is zero. We've got to keep driving at this. And the goals we have set have to cut this in half every year. We'll add in the other ones coming up. See this, a tough one to deal with. And MRSA, of course, are coming right in on the heels of this. So the approach to this that we have taken is this overall model for performance improvement, where the first step is creating the culture. I've talked about setting goals, measurements important, the improvement bit, and then the reward and recognize this cycle of the culture of improvement. And then the actual improvement bit, defining exactly what you're going to do. Take a manageable component to your project. Develop the plan with that front line. Give them the say in it. Implement it. If it's not working, you may need to recycle this. And then the transition. Can't overemphasize that. Who's going to maintain this? Who's going to take ownership of the good work that has been done? If you don't do that, it'll slip. Oops. Sorry. The, the way we've approached this, for all of our major projects, and we set about five or six enterprise level goals each year at a high level. And each of those gets supported by a fairly robust performance improvement team with a defined cynical lead with uh, protected time for that and a, an experienced project manager who keeps it on track. So this is how we resource our major projects. Uh, we have smaller projects happening at the more local level, but our major ones get uh, managed in this way. The expertise of the clinical lead and the organization, structure and organization from the project manager. Clinical leads love this. 
It helps them work through it. They focus where their expertise really is. And then having regular review. We have monthly reviews of all our major projects. So we have a portfolio review. Keep track of are we making progress? Do we need to rethink where our resources are going? This is just a screenshot of our typical uh, online uh, scorecards. These are uh, updates on a regular basis for each of our clinical institutes. And this is just some of the uh, metrics are out there, like readmissions, patient safety indicators, some of the infections. But this is the basis for the internal scorecards, the board review, ex executive, and how the institutes and departments are in front of our leadership on a quarterly basis uh, to look at progress. This is the accountability component. Good data that everyone believes and trusts with regular review on our annual bills at those face-to-face -face meetings. Anything I get on that scorecard, you can bet it's going to improve over the year that it's sitting up there. So I think celebrate success. Accountability is not the finger pointing. It is about understanding where the problems lie, but holding people accountable to making progress and understanding if there are still gaps there that can be closed and what we as leaders can do to help close that. And it is this continuing cycle of improvement. We've got to keep doing it. No matter how good you've got, you can always get better. So really, as I look to the future, uh, more and more healthcare reform keeps poking its head into how we need to be behaving and performing. It's not just about the Affordable Care Act. It's about everything. It's about needing new models of practice it's about thinking differently about how we're delivering care, where we need to focus. Uh, and in, in this one, I would again come back to our Ebola crisis. To me, it's going, that's going to be a huge boost for how we think about hospital infections. I will lay odds that we're going to see a plummeting of our overall hospital infection rates over the next year because of the attention uh, that's going to come in on, on, on in the wake of Ebola. And then pay for performance. It's not just about the hospitals. There are three important CMS programs. Our commercial payers are getting into this space with hospitals. It's about the physicians. Remember, physician quality reporting is here. Physician pay for performance is here in the next uh, uh, three years. And it's about this higher quality to create value, that quality cost equation, uh, really pushing to improve our outcomes, improve the quality, safety side of it. But we have responsibility also in doing that in a, uh, a way that does lower cost. And this is about standardizing practices. Uh, so really, on the horizon, is it sunny or are there storm clouds? Uh, I think there's quite a lot of sun. I think we've learned a lot in the last decade. The challenges are high at the moment. And to me, these are the, the components I try and stop and think about. It's about the basics of healthcare. There's nothing magic about much of the quality work. It's about the outcomes, uh, what we've always wanted for our patients. As a surgeon, I used to think many of the complications I had 20, 30 years ago were inevitable. They're not. We can reduce those. We can eliminate many of them. And it's about eliminating harm. It's about thinking new ways to practice. Healthcare is changing. And we in quality and safety do have responsibility to do that in a way that is going to lower costs. So that's kind of my bird's eye view of what's happening at Cleveland Clinic. It's our campus on a sunny day in Cleveland as you look back to downtown. I think there's an exciting time to be in this space. And I appreciate the opportunity to lay in front of you what I have seen, felt, and am busy doing at the Cleveland Clinic at this time. So back to you, Chuck. Great. Thank you so much. And I know in our Q&A and reactor period, we'd love to talk about how you engage the uh, young leaders uh, of the different uh, departments and integrated their work while they're pretty busy surgeons and internal medicine doctors, primary care doctors, and, and integrated those together because I think all of us are, are, those of us that are thinking about getting a more integrated safety and quality program, you've done a fabulous job there. And I, I think you know, it's one of a kind, actually, and I think it's a terrific job. Uh, we'll move forward now, though, to uh, Chris. Uh, uh, Christopher Peabody goes by Toff. Uh, we met Toff 
years ago at the uh, Kennedy School, at the Harvard uh, Kennedy School, while he was getting his MPH in a joint uh, uh, degree program with the Harvard School of Public Health. Um, Tafias uh, recently uh, finished his residency in emergency medicine at one of the busiest emergency medicine residency programs in the world at the LA County Hospital with the, uh, the University of Ca uh, Southern California. He is now uh, a, on faculty at, the, at UCSF in the San Francisco area and working with us closely on our Care University programs. He's uh, done a wonderful job working with us uh, along the way with medical students and with residents in the areas of patient safety and quality. He has a wonderful uh, international experience working with emergency care and disaster response in, uh, and served in Haiti and China, very dedicated to uh, what so many of our uh, audience on this call are dedicated to patient-centered care and delivering optimal and best care. Uh, however, what we'd like to have Toph address is a program that he founded uh, during his residency program to help uh, residents who are in these very, very grueling programs keep their dreams alive, their altruism, their desire to help others. Uh, what really, what, why did they go into medicine and why did, they, why did any of us go uh, in as caregivers? And now when you really look at the challenges of Ebola, how so many frontline caregivers are taking risks at the front line, very fatigued, and really prone to burnout in a very high stressful environment. And he's come up with a, a fabulous program that was successful uh, 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 in his residency program, and now we'll be taking this to scale across multiple centers in the United States, and he'll be a leader, and we'll use this webinar sort of approach to, uh, to undertake it. So we'd like to have uh, uh, Toff go ahead and, uh, and, and lay the groundwork. However, he'll also be answering some of the questions on this uh, recent Ebola crisis and, and what we need to do in emergency medicine. So Toff, please take it away. Hey, thanks, Chuck. I really appreciate it, and thanks, uh, Mike, for such a great presentation. Um, I hope you can hear me okay. Um, I really want to kind of uh, dovetail this uh, next next uh, talk um, titled Let Up Your Dream Team and Prevent Burnout with exactly what uh, Mike was just talking about, and that is that um, we need that actual cultural change. And by the, hopefully by the time that um, we're done with this talk, you'll have a, a small program that you could uh, potentially um, help implement in uh, your practice environment. And so here's the CME objectives for this talk. We really want you know, people to become aware of uh, what the effects of burnout are on our entire healthcare um, workforce. Um, then we're going to go into how peer-to-peer -peer mentoring groups can help motivate each other to, and then we'll talk to us specifically about the Dream Team program that we started at USC. And then we can um, hopefully come away with this again to, uh, with some actions to prevent burnouts. Um, from uh, the frontline caregivers that uh, all of you all of you have at your institution. So let's start with a little background. To change the culture of healthcare workforce, let's look and see how we are actually trained in the American healthcare system. Right now, how we are trained is that we take the most compassionate, the most idealistic students. And I, I'm, I'm on a number of committees that look at um, residents um, who are applying for medical schools, and it is just incredible the qualifications that uh, we actually uh, get to choose from um, in our residency programs. Um, these, are, these are students that have dedicated their lives to uh, patient-centered care. And then we take them and we put them in a very um, low autonomy, um, high stress situation um, in residency. This, you know, this is like a crucible of residency. And what we are graduating is actually, it looks like the majority of our um, resident physicians are burnt out by the time they become attending. So how can, we, how can we intervene here? A little more background. The definition of burnout, and burnout is actually pretty well defined, um, starting in about the late 70s when people started to, to get interested in um, how the, you know, the uh, physician burnout in general. Um, it's been defined as emotional exhaustion depersonalization, and redu reduced personal accomplishment. And I can tell you every resident in a residency program right now um, definitely hits that first one, emotional exhaustion, because they're just put into um, different scenarios, again, with very low autonomy, and they um, come out of this very emotionally exhausted. Now, where we can help is with the depersonalization and the reduced personal accomplishment 
and that's where we're going to go um, with the Dream Team project um, later. Again, a little more background just to show you kind of the scope of this problem. There has been a validated physician burnout scale that has been developed, and it um, asks a series of, the, of three questions from those three different categories of the definition of burnout. And there's actually been residency programs, um, I think uh, Mike surgical programs actually, um, that have a, a burnout rate as high as 80%. Emergency medicine uh, resident burnout um, over uh, multiple different programs has averaged out to 65%. And again, we see this in emergency medicine uh, for physicians that are in practice as well, a very high amount of uh, physicians that are, are, are just burnt out. Now, why do we care? Now, from the physician perspective, uh, we actually see a lot of decreased productivity, decreased job satisfaction, and this can actually lead to physician depression and substance abuse. But from a patient perspective, and that's really where, what I want to stress here, physician burnout has been linked to the risk of medical errors and has adverse effects on patient safety. And so it's not only just a personal problem for the physician, it also affects the care that they provide. And so um, that's another major reason why I think we need to really focus on how we can, uh, the tools for how we can help prevent burnout. So does our physician training reflect the workforce culture of patient safety that we um, need in our physician leaders right now? I would say uh, no. And what, we, what can we do about it is I think we can start taking a page from under other industries. Um, Bill George uh, um, was an advisor of ours at uh, the Kennedy School, and he was uh, very instrumental in starting um, this kind of small group movement, you know, a peer-to-peer -peer mentoring networks. And uh, these, his two books here are, are il illustrations of what other industries are doing um, to uh, help support not only um, uh, frontline workers in their in their um, companies, but Bill George himself, um, you know, a busy healthcare executive, has a small group that he checks in with all the time. What uh, can we take a page from our own industry? And we all know the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. Um, when Don Berwick came and gave a talk, he talked about how um, IHI was actually started. It was started with a small group of peers that were holding Don accountable for his dreams of starting the uh, Institute for Healthcare Improvement. And they would meet in an uh, airport in Chicago um, you know, monthly uh, before the IHI was founded. So we have, we have uh, actually in the patient safety um, space have had examples, of course, on um, small groups of uh, people have actually um, created not only programs like the IHI, but has also acted as kind of a personal board of directors for its members. So let me talk a little bit more about peer-to-peer -peer mentorship and kind of drill down on what this means. What if each of these um, residents, before they went into residency, before they were burnt out, you know, where, while they were still idealistic, had their own personal board of directors? you know, like a small group of four to five uh, um, of their colleagues, people that are going to be going through this crucible moment of residency together to actually sit there and hold each other accountable for their dreams, the reasons why they went into medicine in the first place. And so that's what we tried to do. We started this uh, small program um, at the um, LA County USC Department of Emergency Medicine. Um, here's a little bit more about the uh, about the program itself. This is one of the busiest emergency departments in the United States. It sees over 180,000 patient visits per year. It's the oldest uh, emergency uh, department of emergency medicine in the U.S. And it's a four-year residency program with 17 residents per class. These are very very busy residents. Um, they are seeing a, a lot of uh, you know what falls through the cracks uh, in the L.A. County area. Um, and they are under a lot of stress and uh, under a lot of uh, stress to produce uh, not only um, good quality care, but also um, very expert, you know, expedient care um, just to get through the, through the waiting room every day. A lot of these residents were burnt out, um, so we started this Dream Team uh, pilot program. So we started it with the interns because they're coming in fresh. They're coming in with their I ideals still intact. Um, and so even before the first day of internship, um, for our pilot program, we start, we had each resident write down a one page of self-reflection on what their goals were for the future. We then split those um, interns up into four to, um, groups of four to five. Each one of those uh, four to five um, um, residents were then uh, paired with a chief resident that they could go to um, if uh, their peer-to-peer um, -peer mentorship 
uh, group needed somebody to help facilitate um, their discussion or, ha or just ask a, a more senior person um, some questions. Overall, the, um, the 17 interns, we had four chief residents, one in charge of each small group. And then overall, the program director was kind of overseeing just to make sure that the um, interns had enough protected time to participate in these groups. So the programmatic requirements, we, you need just the support of the chairman and the program director. And really, it's all the residents that are going to be holding each other accountable for their dreams. So they must have protected time away from the clinical area um, of at least one hour per month. Um, again, these, these programs fulfill um, requirements for residency accreditation. And this is one of the reasons why um, residents around the country have been asking us to, uh, more about our pilot program. It's because they want a way that they can expeditiously fulfill these uh, wellness requirements that the um, accrediting body, the, the ACGME, is having re um, residencies do now. So what is the impact of this? Hopefully, um, uh, interns can discuss shared strategies for their work-life work balance. They can utilize the networks of their peers for career development. They can discuss their research projects. And again, this is a safe place to discuss medical error amongst peers. Now, uh, we had an example of, uh, of an intern who uh, had an iatrogenic or performed an, um, a uh, photosynthesis and uh, had an iatrogenic pneumothorax, a uh, um, complication that's now on the never event list for uh, CMS. And instead of, you know, right before the, uh, he, they went ahead um, and talked to m and instead they were able to talk to their three other colleagues kind of in a safe space with people that are actually there to uh, help you um, get through that. Um, and it, and read, it, interns really found this very helpful. So again, the Dream Team pilot was providing a safe space amongst trusted peers who have an interest in their in already have an interest in the future to discuss medical errors. Uh, it helps with the embarrassment and guilt that a physician can feel, and is starting to create a new investment in our healthcare workforce. That is, uh, this is something that we, if we can carry it forward, may be a difference on how physicians discuss medical errors in the future. So as far as the next steps. Uh, we're currently evaluating the effects of this Dream Team on this resident burnout scale. Um, we're developing tools to evaluate the Dream Team sessions themselves, and we're establishing pilot programs at other institutions. So as far as our future impact, we hope that these can continue, these Dream Teams will continue from residency and beyond. We'll utilize the peers as a personal career support network and help to reestablish physician fulfillment in their career choice. And this comes down to patients, ultimately. It comes down to uh, uh, not only patient safety and with uh, dealing with medical errors, but it, it's also, um, it, also going to create our next physician's um, workforce that uh, comes out of uh, residency and hopefully will uh, look more like this and uh, maintain the compassion for their uh, patient care that they're about to provide. And with that, Chuck, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Toph. We really appreciate it. And when we get to the polling portion of our webinar, we're going to be asking you as an audience about Dream Teams. We'd like you also to kind of write in. We think that the Dream Team concept could really apply to nurses, uh, to infection preventionists, and to a whole host of folks that are already on the job as caregivers and not necessarily uh, physicians in training. And so we'll have a polling question regarding that uh, when we get to it. But uh, I think what I'll do uh, is, before we get to some of the Ebola questions, which could dominate some of our discussion, I'd like to invite uh, Sharon Rossmark, uh, who, again, is uh, a wonderful contributor to healthcare nationally. She, we met her because she was highly recommended by the American Hospital Association as one of the wonderful trustees that went through their program. She's been a trustee at a major hospital in Chicago and then also the patient safety chair at a hospital as a non-clinical executive coming from the insurance industry as a senior executive and doing a marvelous job and did a marvelous job during that tenure, uh, partnered with the, the uh, chief quality officers. So Sharon, maybe we'll just ask you to react to Mike and, and to, to Toff's uh, presentations from your role and your perspective, not only as a trustee, but also as a family member who has actually seen some of the challenges that we have in patient safety and infection outbreak and that kind of thing. 
Well, thanks, Chuck, for the opportunity to, to uh, participate in today's webinar. Can you hear me okay? Yes, ma'am. Great. As uh, First, I'd like to comment on Mike's presentation. Uh, as Mike has indicated, uh, leadership is at the core of the success in meeting quality goals, and that leadership uh, starts at the board level, and I think he laid that out quite nicely. In particular, what I like is that uh, what I've seen is that oftentimes boards really don't understand the issues facing quality uh, officers, and this lack of understanding can lead to less than desired results. And the reason why I say that is that sometimes boards don't understand that the role that they play in cr is critical in influencing and supporting the quality initiatives, many of which Mike laid out in his presentation. So from my perspective, I think the board needs to own quality and patient safety. And as he's indicated, it's a key area of responsibility in which they can direct, um, impact, directly impact. And that includes credentialing of medical staff members. It includes using quality and performance to drive strategy of the organization. And it's certainly making sure the strategies implemented are meeting the needs of the patients. Because many times we get so caught up in measuring that we don't check back and see if it's really meeting the needs of those that we are there to serve. So individually, I think board members need to really engage in uh, make doing rounds at the hospital and talking with staff and listening to their concerns and their needs. And almost uh, it, gives, it gives board members an opportunity to see firsthand quality coordination or care coordination in, in action is how I like to view it. So I think way he, the way he laid out the importance of organizational alignment is, is critical. Uh, it ensures that the culture of the organization from the values to the teamwork and reliability, uh, reliability are all connected. I like to focus on the priorities of aligning with patient safety throughout the organization. And the bottom line is resource allegation. That means the board should, under, should ensure that the resources are provided to support quality goals. And this includes new technology, staffing, and education. Well, great, Sharon. And I think uh, just playing off of uh, this, since we have such a, you know, you have been a speaker for us and, and really give us this unique perspective from the board level. Um, you, you know, you mentioned resource allocation. And we always talk about board members uh, allocating the triple T, talent, time, and treasure, finding the talent, helping make sure that teams have the talent. The, the, the allocated time to do things that are really important, and then the treasure are the financial resources that need to get allocated that are so precious and in short supply. As you, as you heard Toff tell his story uh, of what they did in the residency programs, do you think that trustees might be interested in helping with burnout of clinical folks that are on the job, nurses that are in ICUs, and, and a number of the staff that are really approaching burnout because of the heavy shifts, the heavy load, the heavy stress of caring for people. And you think there's an opportunity for peer-to-peer -peer mentoring in our hospitals after people have finished training? Chuck, i got to tell you, I would be surprised if anyone could find a reason not to implement Todd's process. I absolutely love the concept of what I would refer to as collaborative mentoring. I think that peer-to-peer -peer partnerships with the accountability creates an environment of supporting one another, which ideally would, would continue throughout their careers. But early on, as they're learning and developing together and growing, I can see that this uh, program could eventually evolve to one that's uh, multidisciplinary and is cross-functional in nature. So I think it's a great concept. And quite honestly, I'm surprised it doesn't already exist. So hats off to TOF for establishing it and, and, and putting it out there for others to share and learn from it. Fantastic. I've got a question for Mike now. Uh, Mike, can you tell us, we have a lot of folks that really are very progressive but really know how to get started. How did uh, the Cleveland Clinic and how did you lead getting dedicated staff time of surgeons and, 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 and physicians who are very busy in their practices to have dedicated time allocated to you every week. How do you get such a thing started? Because it's pretty unique, very powerful. I've seen it in action there. But how did you get that started? Uh, I think that is one of the challenges, Chuck. Personally, I got this started because I went to people who had been my most important colleague in my clinical career. I went to my favorite anesthesiologist, interventional radiologist, couple of other surgeons who I knew got it and who I trusted. And I said, if I do this, will you come and do it with me? They all said yes. 
as a great starting point. And so I recognized that we needed to immediately start to grow that. And it was about making it attractive for people to do, <clears throat> but also have some returns. I viewed this as one of the better academic opportunities starting over this last decade. Uh, but I also viewed it as a, for me personally, as a mentoring opportunity to bring some of the younger people in. And gradually, as you have seen happening at the clinic, you've been here several times, is more of the younger people coming on board. Not everyone works out. This is not a role for everyone. I think anyone who is interested in doing it now, I will will give them a project as one of those clinical project leads in their space. If they really rise to the occasion in doing that, they may come on uh, in, in a more permanent way in the, in the quality infrastructure. But it is also a commitment from leadership to say, I will free up. Now, we have an advantage. We're a salaried staff model here. Uh, so it comes down to, uh, it can, will a clinical department chair say, OK, I will commit to their week 20% of this person's time to quality for the next year. But show me some returns. Show me what they're doing that this is benefiting, not just my department, but benefiting the institution. So some advantage for us being a salary staff model. Uh, productivity is still important, but it's not the be all and the end all. So it's this combination of you start by going to your friends uh, and convincing them to do this. You look for the next layer of talent, and particularly offering some of the younger people a career path in this. Then you've got to prepare to mentor them into that path. And when they're not doing well, being honest with them and saying, this may not be for you. Uh, I've probably had an over 50% take in that space. But um, I, you know, after a year, a couple of years, I've had to say, uh, you know, this is, you, you, you're not the leaders we need in this space. And it's a willingness to be open and honest with them when that happens, too. It's fun. Okay. Yeah, great, great comments. Uh, uh, Top, from what you heard from, uh, from Mike, now that you're out in practice at multiple emergency departments and see the pattern of care and you were seeing how people are scrambling uh, with this issue uh, of Ebola, do you think that, uh, uh, you know, what are your observations regarding what Mike has talked about of engaging physician to physician and, and really appealing to their better angels to be involved in safety and quality. And what it, now that you're out of res residency, what could you share with us as some insights out in the community as we, many of our hospitals are also community hospitals out there that are dealing with the same issues you're dealing with today? Yeah, Chuck, that, um, well, especially if you're going to take the Ebola case, um, you know, it, right now in like on the ground in the emergency department, um, there's a there's a rush um, to uh, find out what the best practices actually are, and I think that uh, you you are absolutely hit, have hit the nail on the head as far as what we need um, with um, with Ebola as far as leadership, and uh, we've uh, we've been looking to the CDC for for that leadership, and uh, it's been um, um, quite alarming as to uh, the amount of um, uh, changes that have been going on now, um, and the uh, the two healthcare workers that uh, have uh, been recently infected with Ebola, um, sticking to uh, the or initial CDC protocols that have now been changed. Um, I think that uh, people that have been dealing with Ebola, that's what um, more more like the people like Doctors Without Borders who've been dealing with Ebola for years, have a much more aggressive uh, personal protective equipment protocol. And uh, that is what we've been looking at in the emergency department. And that is something that um, we're looking to our hospital leadership to uh, help us provide in the emergency department uh, for our physicians and our nurses and our, um, the, our other caregivers. We're going to be in contact with uh, um, patients that potentially may have a deadly disease. Um, so it's not, it's not only uh, that we need to know something, it's also that we need to uh, um, you know, have a hands-on experience with it and so I think trainings and peer-to-peer uh, um, -peer trainings and uh, um, the, from our leadership um, all the way down to the frontline staff are going to be what we're going to be focusing on in the next coming days. 
so Tom, I've put up the article that you mentioned uh, in the New York Times that has a, a pretty good comparison of the original CDC guidelines. And, right. and, and, and I, I want to make sure, since this is a crisis this week, that, uh, that the folks that are on this webinar, and then a lot of them are off because they're dealing with a crisis in, you know, th themselves and they're going to pick this up over the next few days. Can you walk us through what we see on the screen now? I've, I've shared the desktop, uh, uh, my desktop of a list. Yeah. This isn't in the slides, but we'll add it to the slides of the comparison well, of original CDC, level two, level three. Can you walk us through that just to help us? Because yeah, I'd be happy to, Chuck. I think, I think uh, you know, what, what the original recommendations were were for, for basically general, like, splash protection. Now, Ebola is not airborne, right? So it comes in little little particles, and then uh, it, it, uh, if it, the way you contact it is usually through mucous membranes like you would any other um, uh, uh, non-airborne uh, disease. Um, and so that's what they were um, recommending was basically this general um, thing seen all the way out over on the left. Now, what what's really amazing is that uh, you know there was no cover of the neck. Um, there was a lot of, uh, of of things that could be exposed. You don't even you don't see booties on this um, person really. Um, there there was a lot of uh, barrier or ways that um, the uh, virus could actually get onto someone, especially if you're thinking about people who are cleaning up. Um, um, vomit and diarrhea from an infected patient. Uh, this does not have the amount of, uh, of protection that uh, you would necessarily think you would need or that's being practiced over in places like Liberia right now. Um, this is what they're now uh, recommending. This middle part is what they're now recommending, and it does have this, uh, this neck cover, and it does cover um, uh, with the, um, the feet and, uh, and, the, and the legs. They're also recommending double gloves at this point, um, and then you can see what the uh, what some one some facilities are going uh, pretty much to um, the the extreme all the all the way over on uh, with this level three suit, and uh, that's that's kind of what uh, um, the they're using now um, with some with some people that they know are actively infected. So so basically, what you've shared with us in our in our speakers circle before we went live on this webinar is that the CDC guidelines have been changing uh, and changed yesterday. Can you walk us through what's changed? Yes, I can. Um, if you look at the, the first uh, picture there, um, then you can, and then you compare it to the second picture, um, the, what they're really uh, recommending is this extra level of pr uh, protection. Um, so you, they want a full body suit now. Um, it, they want uh, your neck covered. Um, they uh, want you to have double gloves. Um, the uh, you know a lot of hospitals are going even further, and uh, um, because of uh, experiences with people have been working with uh, the Ebola virus for quite some time, they use actual chlorine washes um, uh, not a, on their person once they're um, um, they, once they take off their gown. They uh, patients or healthcare workers that have contact with a patient with Ebola will then come out of the room and uh, actually be monitored by a uh, by another uh, observer as they take off their um, protective personal equipment, and it has to be taken off in a certain a certain sequence. And uh, you have a supervisor that watches you do it, and you do not move until the supervisor tells you to. And those types of, uh, you know, the and then washing your hands with the chlorine solution, et cetera, are things that are. Um, and are, uh, are you sprayed down? Uh, uh, is it part of the recommendations at this point to spray down somebody after they've, uh, before they ungown? As far as I understand, the CDC is not recommending that yet. Um, but I do know of uh, certain hospitals that are implementing this type of protocol. They are. Okay, great. Uh, I'm going to shift over to Mike, and then I'll come back to, to Sharon for observations, and also uh, Jenny, because she'll also close us, but I want to get her reaction as a, as a non-clinical healthcare uh, advocate and champion. But uh, you can see that things are evolving, and I, on another monitor, I'm monitoring the, the um, congressional testimonies and grilling that's going on in Washington, and I recommend people watch it to kind of get a feel for the dialogue there. But uh, um, uh, Mike, can you tell us what issues were important regarding travel and what you all have been thinking about in Cleveland since you had 
patient number two actually travel from Dallas to Cleveland and Cleveland and, and back, and, and, and now it's in isolation. It, yeah, I, I think it, that obviously accelerated uh, movement on our radar screens. For the last couple of weeks, uh, we've had uh, training programs for how to properly put on all the protective equipment. There have been volunteers. Uh, people are, we ask for volunteers to participate in uh, readiness for this and have put them through appropriate training programs. I think some of the discussion is around uh, staying current with increasing recommendations for protection. Obviously, some concern about uh, the layers of protection that apparently proved inadequate in the Texas experience. Uh, so I think it's uh, increasing the awareness. I, I think one needs to also say, let's not panic. I think the media are uh, all over it. It's important we know, but I think the risk of instilling a unnecessary degree of panic is there. I think uh, closing schools because they're close to where visitations were done by someone coming in to time is probably a little excessive. So I, I, I think uh, common sense is to prevail somewhere in here too, Chuck. And I think we Absolutely. we have some responsibility in that space. Now I think CDC, my personal view, have been responsible, but getting a little heat perhaps for not being aggressive enough, uh, I think it's a fine balance of, uh, you can be Monday morning quarterback very easily, so it's a fine balance between uh, the known risks and some of the unknowns still with this uh, particular organism. Because it, it, it doesn't make sense when you see the degrees of exposure in West Africa uh, and, okay, there have been problems with healthcare workers there still, but comparative load of exposure they've had compared to the one patient in Texas with what appear to be pretty adequate precautions, uh, well, it makes one concern, to what do we not know about the transmission? And I think uh, being wary is appropriate and important at this stage. Great. I'm going to shift gears just for a moment, and then we'll come back to questions. And we, we uh, want to make sure everybody gets the polling questions, and then we'll show the polling answers in our next webinar. And by the way, we have a leader at CDC that we're going to lead uh, our next webinar in November on, and we already talked to him about the focus of our audience on the emerging issues of outbreaks and what's really important, because they're still in the top three of our audience, our 25,000 person audience or organization, 3,100 hospitals, uh, still put HAIs and infections and outbreaks right up at the very top. But we'd like to ask these questions. So the polling is in the right lower, right hand lower corner of your screen, and it's on a scale of 1 to 10, and we'll create a net promoter score. The first question is, do you feel your organization, and if you don't, aren't at a local hospital uh, and, and work at a hospital, but you're an attendee and you have an impression one way or the other, or your local hospital is prepared for an, an Ebola patient, uh, 10 would be strongly, very strongly agree, a 1 would be very strongly disagree. Second question, would you like a webinar on Ebola and the emerging infection best practices? We'd be prepared to put on a t it costs us about 100 or about 250 man hours totally all in to create all the continuing education credit content and to put on such a webinar. But we really are committed to do it. If you as an audience tell us, hey, we'd really like to have a webinar with some experts on the evolving issues, especially at the front line who are dealing with it in community hospitals as well as, as, well as teaching and urban and safety net hospitals. Uh, if you'd like that, let us know. Would you like a webinar with a deep dive on concepts, tools, and resources? Uh, I know we will, we will have CDC in November, but we could do a special webinar on this. We'd like to know whether you'd like a deep dive on it. The third, which is I think a really critical issue, would you like to see innovations in protection of caregivers and patients, including cleaning innovations, 
used to protect against contagious infections. We're understanding now, we're just learning right now, but there, there are a number of new solutions that have been used on cruise ships and a whole host of other venues very effectively that could uh, address C. diff, MRSA, and now the Ebola issues. Would you like to see some of these technology innovations? And again, we're always going to focus on leadership practices and technologies, not a technology alone, but how this integration of what leaders need to do, how you integrate it into best practice, and then what the technologies are. If you very strongly agree at 10, if you very strongly disagree at 1, and then we'll respond to that by being able to kind of provide some of those uh, to you. Uh, Kyle, can you advance the slides uh, for me? It appears, oh, there I've got control again. The next question is, would you like to have a deeper dive on the new demands on quality leaders? Uh, when I introduced Dr. Henderson, I talked about this move from volume to value and doing population management. And a number of you are now having to assume the role of a network, not just your hospital, but now a number of physician practices, outpatient imaging centers, outpatient laboratories, outpatient um, uh, 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 procedure centers and, and, and operating uh, uh, rooms and, and outpatient surgery facilities. So would you like a deeper dive that is specific on the new demands of the quality and safety leaders? We're lumping them in together. Chief quality officer, patient safety officer, head of quality, uh, and uh, we'd include infection as well um, uh, in that. Next question. Would you like to be invited to belong to a community of practice in, for, of quality leaders and infection prevention leaders? And this a community of practice is a group that would meet by webinar on a monthly basis. We support it with web uh, resources and hopefully not anything redundant, but just the links to the things that are really critical. And I think Toph uh, uh, will be leading a community of practice on Dream Team. Uh, where you'll be a, a lead expert, but we'll have other experts on burnout, fulfillment, happiness, keeping work-life balance, especially in the grueling endeavors of being a, a, a physician in, in practice, a physician in training, nurse in practice, nurse in training as well, because we think the dream team really could cross multiple categories. You started it in residencies, but I just see no reason why this couldn't be for medical students and for uh, folks out in the field that are, that are after their training. And we'll, we'll offer continuing education credits for it. The next question, we're almost done. Would you like to see a dream team program for caregivers after they are trained? and in the workplace. And Sharon, this is the question I ask you. Is, do you think boards would resonate with providing some financial resources to keep the dreams alive of the caregivers that are at work? Because a number of them are, are burned out at work. They're carrying multiple shifts. They've got families. Many, uh, many of our nurses are single parents uh, who are juggling 12-hour shifts. Uh, and are really the frontline uh, heroes of care. And we'd like to know um, if you believe that a Dream Team program would be helpful there. And then the final uh, two questions are open text. And these have been so helpful to us at TMIT, putting in as many ideas as you have. Would you like to learn more? Would you like to learn about leading infection prevention and care of patients? We're seeing so many innovations that aren't getting any airtime. Uh, and we want to know, would you like to learn more about them, and are you aware of some that you'd like to know more about? Whatever you're thinking, put it down. We read these carefully. We've got really great ideas that have come through, and we'll report them on our next webinar. And then finally, what would you like to learn about Dream Teams and Burnout? Are there things in more detail that Toph didn't have a chance with our limited time to cover that you'd like to learn more about? The, for instance, the evidence-based approach to how much burnout is actually in our, our, our mass of care, uh, caregivers, uh, what, what are the warning signs, what can we do, what resources are available, what's working and what's not. So please, uh, please go ahead and fill those things out and, and let us know. And now I'd like to shift things back over uh, to, uh, to our, our Q&A. But I've, I've teed up some of the issues. Let's go back to Mike. Any comments? of some of the dialogue that you'd like to address uh, before we wrap up today, Mike. And I'm going to ask Toph and come to Jenny uh, uh, after that and then share it. No, I, I heard some of Toph's stuff previously. Nice job putting it together. And the concepts are so great, Toph. I think uh, it's a new era. It's tough on people coming into the program and getting some structure around 
the things that you have started to do there would be huge. I think this should really take off. I really like it. And one quick question, Mike. Do you think that uh, there would be interest in the nursing staff at, uh, at some of our larger hospitals and, uh, and others that are delivering care today? Because we, we, we hear, uh, you know, over the, uh, over the transom an awful lot of burnout, a lot, you know. Yeah, I, I'm sure there is. I, I bow to the knowledge of some of the nurses and nursing programs. But I think, by and large, they do a lot better job in terms of some of their governance structures and things, Chuck. So I think that's got to be thought about carefully in the context of what I perceive as quite a lot of uh, structure around how they are supported. But building those concepts deeper into that would be huge. Uh, I suspect it's a slightly different model, but I think it's still important. Great, great. And before I uh, uh, now move to the top, I just want to thank Natalie Walker uh, in the Q&A window has let us know that there's a conference call with nurses across the U.S. and officials from uh, HHS to discuss protecting the health of nurses while safely caring for patients with Ebola. And uh, to, it'll be 1.30 to 2.30 uh, uh, East Coast time uh, uh, on Thursday. Uh, and I guess it's uh, it's it's today, but I'm sure that they'll be uh, they'll be uh, it'll be recorded. And thanks, Natalie, for letting us know about that. And other questions that people have, please insert them uh, for Mike Henderson and Toff, and uh, uh, and uh, we'll come back to them. Uh, Toff, your comments on what you've been hearing and things that you'd like to add before we uh, before we wrap up. Yeah, I think there's this uh, a ton of opportunity, as uh, as Mike has uh, said, and in, in taking uh, new. Uh, you know, physicians like myself and bringing them into the uh, quality and patient safety uh, space. I think we have a, a really um, interesting challenge here with uh, this emerging infectious disease that is uh, coming into our country um, with Ebola. I think it's a great uh, um, chance to use some of those uh, leadership techniques that uh, my kids um, are even uh, talking and discussing. Um, I think things like, you know, checklists for infectious control or, and uh, CDC rapid response teams and, you know, uh, things like um, uh, training and going through personal protective equipment is really going to prepare our um, healthcare system and make us feel like we're um, better prepared uh, for dealing with something like this. I think those are all um, classic quality improvement, patient safety, leadership, and frontline um, uh, training uh, um, uh, things that we've we've uh, constantly been talking about um, um, on these webinars, and so I think it really fits into that uh, model well. And, and Top, just take a moment, and uh, I think there are new apps and abilities to develop some very fast reaction uh, content that may we can use over our smartphones. And just take you know 20 seconds and tell us what you did in your disaster uh, work using uh, using technologies and apps when you were international working in Haiti and. In China. Yeah. So, in uh, well, especially uh, you know, after an earthquake, there's uh, basically no uh, there's no infrastructure, and so uh, dealing with patients like we were in Haiti uh, with uh, in field hospitals was uh, very difficult, especially for uh, patient tracking. And so now that technology is so good, we were able to you know, go in with a mobile satellite, set up a wireless internet connection around the uh, around the field hospital itself. And then we're able to use mobile phones um, to track uh, the um, vulnerable populations, like um, minors that were orphaned after earthquakes, or um, um, pregnant women, or um, people that were now not ambulatory, um, and just know where people are and have a general. Um, you know, you could set up a field hospital with a with a group of physicians with their iPhones um, very rapidly by the time we were done with our with our projects and. Uh, so it's uh, something that technology uh, um, can actually help us, um, you know, with uh, emerging uh, um, diseases like Ebola um, in a very austere environment. Um, and so uh, I think that um, people are using uh, these types of technology uh, over in West Africa now. And uh, I think we'll, um, we can uh, learn from uh, what they're doing over there here at home as well. Well, great, and I'm going to go to, to Jenny so you can make a comment before you take your close because I'll go to Jenny and then to Sharon. So, Jenny, you're from what you've been hearing, and then we'll come back to you for our close a little bit later. But go, go ahead, Jenny. Uh, uh, is there anything that jumps off the page to you as a patient advocate and a tireless champion talking to a lot of patients and 
patient safety out there and families. Well, I'm just so impressed with both doctors' ideas and, and their fresh look at everything, and it's really inspiring. The only thing I would add with Dr. Henderson, I've always wanted to engage patients and families on committees and boards, and I would uh, encourage you and everyone on this call to open your doors to engage these folks because they could help you so much in everything that you're doing. But I'm really, really excited about what you talked about, Dr. Henderson. Dr. Peabody, I am just so tickled about your dream teams. Um, at our group, Pulse, we're a support group mostly for uh, people who have experienced harm, but we have a lot of clinicians call us who are suffering from burnout, and they just really don't have anywhere else to go. There's also another group called MITS that, that does a great job with these people. But I've always dreamed myself of having in-house support for clinicians and, and, and a gold star program. and. Um, in increasing confidence in clinicians and building them up and, and making their work environment a happy place, a positive place with positive reinforcement, and more than anything, making their place of work a safe place, a pl a, where they have a place to go if they're not happy with something and someone they can talk to about it. I just can't thank you both enough for everything that you're doing. Well, and thank you for that, Jenny, because I'm going to come to Sharon because the boards really need to, I keep relentlessly putting up the slide of the ARC study of the 600,000 staffers, a very, very well done study that showed 37% of our staff are afraid to speak up even during something that is going wrong, a medical error or something going wrong. Two thirds are afraid that something like that would be put in their, in their file. Over 80% uh, are afraid to report. Um, Sharon, this is like this is the, the the worst indictment of our leadership. I don't want to finish on a downer, but this is an enormous opportunity for us to what to have the back of our caregivers. And I think you know, as a, as a trustee and, and someone who other trustees look to, um, I think there's an enormous opportunity for boards to kind of weigh in to really help caregivers understand that they've got their back. Because I know you really believe in that. Could you comment on that before we go to Jenny? Uh, yeah, actually, I look at it as a positive in terms of the, the size of the opportunity. So as Mike pointed out in his conversation, this is about the board leading the effort to create a, a culture within the organization that's focused on safety and teamwork and reliability. And if you have staff that are not comfortable speaking up and you know, providing input that allows for process improvement, then the system is broken and the board needs to be aware of it. And so. The only way we can fix it is if the board is aware and they're in a position to allocate resources to support those initiatives that are needed, uh, showing up and provide the, uh, the support needed. And don't you think that the boards would really step up to help the, the, you know, with this issue of nurses feeling unsafe and not having their back? I, I, I just can't imagine a board that would not step up. Uh, oh, absolutely. And i got to imagine that the board in Texas has is, is got to be wondering what all they can do. And hopefully they're reaching out to the, the nurses and making sure that the support is in place moving forward. And while they may have had some missteps, the organization may have had some missteps in the past, hopefully they're, they're learning from this and they're focused on solutions and giving everyone the support they need. And, and it's a tough time. And we know their chief quality officer is a great guy, uh, just has a great history in safety and quality, has worked with us uh, uh, before. We know the great leaders, that there's great leadership in many of these hospitals. And so when you're blindsided by a crisis like this, you're in the fog of war. And, and I want to kind of close with net forward energy that we learned from uh, Doug Krug. So important to just to limit the negative and really maximize the positive energy towards solutions going forward because it's absolutely critical. Uh, and we, we, we 80% negative energy is not going to help us fix things that we need to fix. And there's lots to fix. It's very clear. Uh, I, I want to thank our our speakers. Fantastic job. And we'll be. We know Mike will be continuing to lead the way to help us understand the journey to the and to the uh, chief quality officer in the future. And I'm really hopeful that Toff can help uh, take this dream team effort uh, not only vertically in our training programs, but horizontally across multiple caregiver uh, groups. And uh, Sharon, thank you so much. Uh, you're just you know, a breath of fresh air every time we talk to you. And Jenny, thanks for your dedication. So Jenny, would you please close us and then have the speakers just stay in the bullpen for a few minutes after? Jenny?
and uh, God bless you all, and we'll talk. We'll see you next uh, next month with uh, I think uh, one of our great leaders from CDC that'll be speaking to us. Jenny, you want to close us? Thank you so much, Dr. Denham. You're always such an inspiration to me, and I think you, yourself and others like you are going to be the leaders that are going to get us out of this Ebola mess in this country, and, and you're such a blessing, as are your webinars and everyone who is on this webinar today. As I said, I'm really tickled and thankful for everything that you're doing here. Thank you, everyone who is here participating and filling out the poll questions. And uh, just keep coming back and tell all of your colleagues to come back to these webinars. Thank you so much. And um, God bless everyone here. Thank you. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, and so that ends our, our session. I'd like to remind you all that uh, on the web, you'll be able to watch the congressional uh, testimony, I think, on C-SPAN. And there's a lot of great content, but the, things are changing rapidly. So we'll keep our eye on it. Thank you so much.